Have you ever made the experience to wake up at night and feel insecure about your future? Today, due to technological innovations, many options are available to change our life and work. But at the same time, we see more protectionism, nationalism, climate change, and the disruptions of digitization regarding the way how we collaborate and interact with each other. If you ask me, what is the main difference of the digital age compared to all other economic development phases in the past? The answer is clear. Speed. Speed in changing customer expectations, dis implementing disruptive business models and emerging technologies. Speed produces a high pressure on us. In general, we are able to adapt our behavior to a new situation. But now, we have to be more agile. The world is rapidly changing and makes us feel uncertain about our future. The key question is how to find orientation in, un in an uncertain world. Let me tell you a story we have experienced. We met Hans. Hans is the owner and CEO of a German heating system manufacturer, producing heating and cooling systems and selling them directly to the installers. Hans is the third generation of a family business. He took over leadership from his father five years ago, who led the company for almost 20 years. The company is headquartered in a rural area. They are one of the hidden champions. Hans is the biggest employer, and many people who are living in this region are working there for many years. He has the responsibility to all of these families, and he is aware about this. But only a long-term strategy ensures the prosperity of all. Hans recognized three different challenges in the digital age. First, due to the shift of value creation from products to services, it is more important to sell a smart home service instead of a physical product. Second, these digital services need to be designed from a customer-centric perspective. Based on data, his company has to know exactly the needs and behaviors of their clients to provide an experience of well-being in different rooms. And third, companies like Google and Apple are becoming new competitors in the smart home ecosystem by providing personalized services. As tech firms, they will enter the traditional value chain of the heating system industry with their disruptive service-orientated business models. Hans knew that he had to start a journey. And he told to us, now I have 25 years' time to transform my company being as successful in the digital age as we were in the past before I give the company to my kids. He saw all these possibilities with new technologies, but he had no clue about his appropriate business vision. How could he find orientation in these uncertain times? Well, the question is, what is our contribution as advisors when we work with people like Hans? Yesterday, consultants' attitude was that they knew better than their clients how to manage the company. They gave orientation by an attitude of knowing better. Today, consultants' attitude is rather to provide orientation by an attitude of elaborating a future disruptive business vision. To realize 
such a disruptive business vision, you have to link the cultural and the structural changes. Cultural meaning new people's skills and new ways of organizing work. Structural meaning new processes and new technologies. However, we identified one issue. Executives like Hans are actually not clear about what is the spectrum of potential options they have and what are the corresponding cultural and structural implications. So the question is, what gives us guidance to identify the possible future business options? Well, we can create a simple model by putting the cultural and the structural dimensions in two different axes. The endpoints of the cultural and the structural axis represent two possible extremes with opposite positions. One cultural endpoint means focusing on the interests of the individual. In a company, this means a silo mentality Teams are only focusing on their individual interests. The other cultural extreme means focusing on the interests of the collective. The primary attitude is network thinking. One structural endpoint is a fragmented organization that operates like a machine being composed of different independent parts. The other structural endpoint is an integrated organization that operates like a living organism, being a complex adaptive system. So let's see how a company might look like in the four different quadrants. In the upper left corner, there are hierarchically decomposed independent business units. There is internal competition, we measure and we reward individual performance. In the lower left corner, there are still independent business units, but they follow a common vision and they have common goals. People are driven by a purpose that is higher than their individual success. Leadership is a matter of choice, not position. In the lower right quadrant, there is a highly adaptive network. Common vision is priority. Individual performance is valued as a contribution to the collective vision. And finally, in the upper right quadrant, a company follows meritocratic principles, but shares common resources and common knowledge. Individual performance counts and there's still in, uh, inter inter internal competition. Leadership is only with a few alpha individuals. So, this simple model provides like a frame of reference to identify potential future options for the business and it allows to conclude on the cultural and structural implications. Let's go back to Hans. He knew that he couldn't delegate his responsibility of defining a business vision to someone else. He's in charge of it. After he understood the playing field, he invited all executives in his company for a management meeting and started evaluating the different options of a business vision. In general, we have identified five business model options that may serve as a business vision. We then related the five business model options to their structural and cultural implications. First, technology-enabled business. In addition to the current sales channels, the company is starting to sell heating and cooling products via online channels. And at the same time, they have to be aware of a consistent user experience between online and offline channels. Because 
now we are buying a product directly from the installer or from a web shop. And to do this, we have to align the marketing and the sales processes with each other. And for the first time, the company is analyzing customer data and starts gaining insights to develop new data-driven services. Second, transaction-oriented business. Heating and cooling products will get smart with sensors and connect them to a platform. And based on this platform, automated transactions are possible. Now, we are able not only to sell a heating system, we are also able to sell smart um, heating regulation services or predictive maintenance services. Third, customer experience business. We are gathering more and more usage data and develop customer profile based on customer behavior. That way, we learn more about customer needs and their personal preferences. This is important to sell individualized services like smart individualized temperature regulation. Fourth, solution-oriented business. Hans is no longer selling pure heating and cooling products and services. He will sell a smart home end-to-end -end solution. This means selling a smart home service based on the different preferences of each family member, which contains heating, cooling, lightning, sun shields, door protection, water controlling services provided by partners. Hans does not only sell his own products and services, he sells the products and services of partners. So he will become an orchestrator of an end-to-end -end value chain with different suppliers. Fifth, open digital business. Hans will become a smart home ecosystem platform provider. He is setting the standards. He determines the rules which partners have to comply with. He defines who will get access and who doesn't. So if he can set the standard, the industry standard, for a smart home ecosystem, he will have a big competitor advantage in the market. We had a long discussion about the right ambition level, and at the end, Hans and his management team decided a two-step approach. First, short term, they have to renovate IT and marketing to be able to implement a transaction-oriented business. And second, they decided that the long-term strategy of the company will be a solution-oriented business. So Hans will set up a smart home platform and become a solution provider. After defining the business vision, the next question is how to implement it. Yes, so as Hans has now defined his business vision, immediately the next question arises. How do we get there? To answer this question, we need to break down what key capabilities his company needs to realize his business vision. This set of key capabilities will bundle together the cultural and the structural implications for each single capability in a kind of manageable module. For instance, in the case of Hans, managing and analyzing large amounts of data is a new key capability because he envisions a future business vision where that is, that is very much data-driven. So to implement such a big data capability, he has to introduce new people skills and new ways of organizing work. He needs people with new skills 
that find out what data is required and where does the data come from. He needs data scientists that can make sense of the data, working together in an interactive knowledge community. On the structural side, he needs to introduce new processes for managing the data because he needs to get the data quality in the right shape. He also needs to introduce new technologies for managing the data, consolidating and integrating data from different sources. So he needs this new big data capability that influences culture by introducing new people skills and new ways of organizing work but it also changes structure by implementing new processes and technologies. Hans can now continue with this approach regarding all relevant capabilities, and he gets a comprehensive overview of those capabilities. Then in order to answer this question of how can I fulfill my vision, he can assess the maturity of those capabilities in his company. He can then create a plan that gives him guidance to close the identified gaps and to fulfill his business vision. So summing up, there are three steps for finding orientation in an uncertain world. Number one, link the cultural and the structural changes and define the opposite endpoint positions. Number two, Identify your options and relate them to their cultural and structural positions. Number three, choose your preferred option and conclude on the necessary capabilities. Well, we have illustrated how this approach of finding orientation may work for a company. It may also work for a person, a team, a country or a society. For example, you may ask yourself, what is your vision for the country that you live in or for Europe? What is the capabilities we need to build to achieve that vision? And what is your way forward for maturing those capabilities? Thank you. <laughs>